Um, today, today's webinar, which is jointly hosted by the Colorado Farm to School Task Force and Spark Policy Institute, is called Making Evaluation Easy, Outcomes, Indicators, and Measures. We've got almost everybody who's registered, so we'll go ahead and get started. A few housekeeping points one more time so that everybody's on the same page. There are two ways to hear audio for today's webinar. One is automatically through your computer speakers, which appears to be working, and the other is via a teleconference using the call-in number listed um, on the front page. Um, we do currently have all participants in the audio conference on mute to reduce background noise. As this is a fairly large webinar, we will be holding, uh, not be holding a verbal question and answer period, but instead we'll be asking people to, join, to ask questions and share experiences through the chat function at the right side of your screen. When you do send a chat, please make sure that send to all panelists is selected. Unfortunately, attendees cannot see each other's chat comments, so Lynn will be reporting answers out to everybody um, to make sure that we can share and learn with each other. I do want to let you know that we will be recording today's webinar and the recording will be posted on the Colorado Farm to School website in a few days. On the screen, you will see links to handouts you will need um, for today's webinar, and you can either type them directly into your browser or I will type them into the chat box on the right side of your screen um, once I introduce Lynn. So without further ado, I will hand you over to our presenter, Lynn Kathleen. Thank you, Sophie. As Sophie mentioned, um, this webinar and the series are brought to you by the Colorado Farm to School Task Force with Spark Policy Institute. My name is Lynn Kathleen, and I am a senior research associate at Spark. SPARC was chosen through a competitive bid process in 2010 to staff the Colorado Farm to School Task Force. SPARC Policy Institute is a national change agent organization that collaborates with nonprofits, foundations, policymakers, and communities to find innovative, dynamic solutions to complex problems. SPARC provides the task force with a wide range of services, including research, regulatory and legal analysis, evaluation, facilitation, and training. The task force was legislatively mandated in 2010 by the Colorado General Assembly. It has 15 appointed members. It is charged with increasing the use of local farm and ranch products in school food service programs to improve child nutrition and strengthen local and regional agricultural economies. The task force receives no funding from the state of Colorado. However, it has successfully attracted a wide array of funders, starting with a federal ARA stimulus grant. SPARC staffs the task force and provides a wide range of those services that I mentioned before. In 2012, the task force identified a major gap in farm to school programming in Colorado. We simply had very little information about what our districts were doing and the districts engaged in farm to school were not systematically assessing their farm to school activities. To address this gap, the task force along with SPARC Policy Institute developed the farm to school evaluation toolkit for Colorado. With a two-year USDA Farm to School grant, the toolkit is now being rolled out nationwide through in-person workshops and webinar trainings. Today's webinar is the second in a five-part series of the Farm to School Evaluation Toolkit training. All of the webinars will be archived at a link on this slide. So let's just start with a poll. We'd like to know how many of you attended webinar number one or listened to the archive version. Sophie? Okay, so by now you should know the polling function appears on the right side of your screen, and this time you'll only have 30 seconds to answer, and you can go ahead and select one of the options, please. Okay, so the results should appear on the right side of your screen. It looks like most of you did attend last week's webinar. A few of you viewed the recording, and um, five of you, this is the first webinar you've attended. So that's great. Welcome. Okay, thank you. It's good to know who's in our audience. Okay. You should have received these handouts in the reminder email um, earlier this week. If you were on last week's webinar, you should continue filling out the plan you already started. 
If you are joining us for the first time, you can still work on Step 2. After today's webinar, you can go to our archives to listen to last week's training on beginning your evaluation plan. You also need one of the seven attachments. If you know which target group you will be evaluating, then just have that attachment ready. If you have not yet downloaded any or all of the attachments, please go to this link on the Colorado Farm to School website, scroll down and download the Overview and Steps, the Evaluation Plan template, and one or more of the attachments. Or you can click on the links in the chat box on the right side of your screen. Today in webinar number two, we'll introduce you to the evaluation speak of outcomes, indicators, and measures, but we'll tie each of these to the reality of farm to school activities and programming. We'll cover how to select and prioritize outcomes, how to determine what is realistic to measure, and how to make sure you are measuring outcomes that accurately reflect your program's impact. We'll also pay attention to the purpose of your evaluation, as that is an important determinant of what you'll want to measure. By the end of this hour's training, you will have increased your understanding about farm to school outcomes and how these are tied to indicators and measures. You'll have made progress on identifying and selecting outcomes that you will document on your evaluation plan. And you'll continue along the journey of increasing your confidence to undertake an evaluation. Let's first start with a brief overview of the Farm to School Evaluation Toolkit. In a succinct eight pages, the Farm to School Evaluation Toolkit Overview walks you through each step of the evaluation process. Last week, we started with an overview of the toolkit and began filling out step one of the evaluation plan. Today, we are focusing on step two, identify your outcomes. In our webinar training series, we'll cover every step and you will work with the template and attachments. Just as a reminder, the toolkit contains the how-to guide, the evaluation plan template, seven attachments, and three appendices. Each of these were overviewed last week. If you need a reminder of their contents, please go back to webinar number one. Okay, let's get started on step two. To begin, let's think about evaluation from the standpoint of what we do and why we do it. There are two concepts I want to cover. The first is what we call a sphere of control. The sphere of control, as the name suggests, are those things we have control over, or at least we think we do. It is the activities of our program, the deliverables to our funders, the timelines of milestones reached, and the number of people involved in our program. These are the things we do. And in evaluation, these are the metrics, or our counts, of what has occurred. These are typically the things we do measure. They tell you about the effort you put in, but they actually don't tell you about the why bother of the program. The second concept is the sphere of influence. The sphere of influence is the change we hope to see occur through the farm to school programs we implement. These can be categorized into short, intermediate, and long-term outcomes. So in a school garden program, a short outcome might be that students have increased awareness and knowledge about how plants grow, or an appreciation that where one lives determines what type of food can be grown, and that being a locavore means prioritizing foods that are grown locally. All of these examples are things we would hope a student would learn by participating in a garden program that includes lesson plans about plant biology and local food systems. And while you have control over creating that garden, having students participate in the garden, developing and teaching that curriculum, you actually do not have control over whether those outputs of your farm to school program will actually result in student learning. Learning falls within the sphere of influence. Yet it is the sphere of influence that is the reason why we do the work we do. As you have figured out, the sphere of control leads to the sphere of influence. As we move forward in today's training, and indeed throughout your evaluation planning, we're going to talk a lot about how our activities, those things in the sphere of control, and our outcomes, the sphere of influence, are connected. And if you ever feel stuck on what you're measuring, do return to these concepts. Okay, let's pause for a moment.
We'll be digging deeper into the examples of outcomes in the sphere of influence, but it might be fun just to get some quick thoughts about what you all are doing. So if you would like to share one example of what you're hoping to influence through your Farm to School program, please do so by typing it in the chat box. I'll read them as they appear. Here is one, reduce obesity within my county. That's a great long-term outcome. Increase student food consumption, consumption of fruits and vegetables. That's a, um, that's what we're going to put in as an intermediate outcome. Change the eating habits of children within the school system. Again, another intermediate outcome, increase the consumption of healthy food. Yes, students try new foods and increase consumption of fruits and veggies. These all make sense. This is really the heart of farm to school programming. Oh, keep farmers on the land and viable. Oh, that's a great one. We often don't don't remember that really key component. Decrease the food miles from farm to institution. There is a wonderful environmental impact. Um, please do remember to send to all panelists if you can, so that um, both Sophie and I can see all of them. Um, oh, here's a lovely one. Change the habits of parents, too, through their children. Yes, that connection of what the children learn to, in school and how it reaches out into the family is a big, big goal that we often are hoping our farm to school programs will have. Engage students in growing produce served in the cafeteria. Provide students access to fresh fruits and vegetables that they may not have access to outside the school day. That's a really important one, especially in those schools that are really located in, you know, that term we often use of a food desert. Help create systems for including local farms in institutional buying. That's, that, that's a very interesting institutional change um, that is um, a system change. So, okay, you guys are wonderful. Thank you for sharing your outcomes. These are wonderful outcomes, and you're going to have a lot of fun in today's webinar in thinking about how to tie these outcomes directly into the toolkit that will guide you on how to assess those. So let's get back to our um, presentation. Okay, hold on. Now I want to introduce you to a logic model because logic models can organize the what's and the why's into a format that will facilitate your evaluation planning. Logic models use words and or pictures to describe the sequence of activities thought to bring about change and how these activities are linked to the results the program is expected to achieve. The process for thinking through change includes identifying the problem, so in other words, what is the community or school need, naming that desired result. What is the vision for the future that you have? What do you hope your program's going to achieve? And then between that problem and the vision is the strategy you will have developed to address the problem and reach your goal or future vision. The strategy consists of your program components. Here is a typical logic model. It is a simplified pictorial depiction of the relationship between your program's activities and its intended effects. Let's break it down based on our previous three conceptual buckets, problem, vision, and strategy. First, you'll want to identify the problem. On the far left side, depicted by the arrows, is information about what the problem is that you are addressing. Here, this is called the situation. And within the situation are priorities that are linked to why the situation or problem is an issue. For example, you may want to work, you may work for a community garden organization. And within your organization's mission, vision, values, or mandates may be statements about the importance of increasing food system knowledge for youth and adults. A problem identified by your organization may be that youth lack knowing where their food comes from. And within the situation, you may want to articulate why youth do not know where their food comes from. For example, maybe it's a lack of agriculture or food system education within the schools. Maybe it's because they live in an urban area and they're far away from an agricultural um, economy and way of life. These are things that you could put within understanding the situation. 
Next, you'll want to name the desired results. What is the vision that you have for the future? In the logic model, the desired results are your goals, which are called your outcomes or impacts. There are really three types of outcomes. There are short-term, which are also known as the first outcomes you can expect or a program to achieve if it's well implemented. These are basically the learning outcomes of awareness, knowledge, attitudes, some skills, opinions, aspirations, and motivations. Next comes medium-term outcomes. Those are those that would be expected after some of those short-term outcomes have actually been achieved. These are action outcomes. They're changes in behavior, practices, decision-making, policies, and social action. And finally are the long-term outcomes, which are also called impacts. These follow upon the achievement of short and medium-term outcomes. These are system changes, be they social, economic, civic, environmental, cultural, et cetera. Between the problem and the vision is the strategy you will have developed to address the problem and reach your goal or future vision. This is shown on your logic model under the category of outputs. There are two components. The work action strategies of your program, such as building educational school gardens, conducting workshops for teachers, developing and implementing educational curriculum for students, teaching garden schools, all fall under this strategy. Then there are the target groups of your program or who you intend to reach, be they individuals or organizations. When you put it all together, you have a graphic representation of your program, the participants you are targeting with your program, and the outcomes you hope to achieve. The logic model is a great tool to help you plan your evaluation as it keeps you focused on your activities, target audience, and intended outcomes. Each of these is information that's necessary in order for you to design your evaluation. Here is a logic model that was developed for an actual school garden. It has inputs outputs and outcomes. The inputs are the staff, research money, and materials for the school garden. The outputs are divided into two categories, activities and participants. The activities are what's happening in the school garden to support that garden. Here we see a lot of curriculum sessions are specified, sessions on nutrition, plant growth needs, and beneficial insects. We also see skill building activities, including planting, weeding, and harvesting. The participants are the target audience that's involved in the garden program. Here we see that the primary school students will be using the garden and that teachers will also be involved, likely teaching the curriculum. But don't forget about others who come into contact and support your garden, such as community and parent volunteers. And finally, in this garden program, they've identified its ministers as participants. Likely, these are the school principal or vice principal. Everything within the outputs column falls within our sphere of control. These are the things we'll want to measure. For example, how many workshops were conducted? What type and how many garden activities occurred? How many students and teachers participated? These are actually the easy things to measure, and they should be measured as they're important to demonstrate the activities occurring within the program and who and how many people are being reached by the program. Now let's take a look at the final three columns of the logic model. These are the outcomes of your program. These three columns reflect changes that happen over time. In this garden, short-term outcomes are the learning of awareness and knowledge development. The medium-term medium outcome is the action outcome of practice, learning to grow edible plants. And the long-term outcomes are the system changes that result in a culture that appreciates fresh food production and quality, embraces physical activity, and appreciates nature. Everything within the outputs falls within that sphere of influence. It is the changes that should occur through the implementation of the program. These are the more complicated to evaluate, yet it is exactly this information that is the most important to know because it will tell us if our program is having its intended impact. A logic model is an important tool for depicting your farm to school program in preparation for selecting your evaluation outcomes, indicators, and measures. Okay, one more quick poll right now, which is let's find about, out about your experience with logic models. Sophie? Okay, thank you, Lynn. So everybody, um, the poll again will appear on the right side of your screen, and you'll have about 30 seconds to answer.
Okay. Looks like most of you have um, answered. Let's see what we have here. Um, the results should appear on the right side of your screen. And it looks like most of you have developed or helped develop a logic model for other programs. Um, some of you are aware of logic models but have never developed or used them. And great. Um, that's great. So we have a diverse uh, mix of people here. Okay. Let's move on now. Um, but one thing I want to do before we leave outcomes is I want to think just a little bit more about what kinds of evidence you're looking for when you're doing outcomes. So these changes, as I said before, can take place over the short, intermediate, or long term. Long term outcomes are sometimes referred to as impacts. From our previous logic model, one of the short-term outcomes identified as a result of participating in a school garden program is, is an increased awareness in where nutrition, an increased awareness of nutrition and where food comes from. A garden program that includes nutrition education is growing a wide variety of plants, can be expected to increase students' awareness about nutrition and how food is grown in the soil, not just simply found in the grocery store. Short-term outcomes are the most closely associated with program activities. And I really can't overemphasize this understanding that you want to think about how long has your program been going on and make sure that you are definitely tapping into those short-term outcomes, um, at least some of them, when you're doing your evaluation. An intermediate um, term outcome is one that is expected to take more time and exposure to develop and is typically the result of a short term outcome. In the logic model on the previous slide, one intermediate outcome is for students learning to grow edible plants. School garden programs that include full plant life cycle training, starting with growing seedlings to soil preparation, planting, watering, insect control, weeding, harvesting, and winterizing the garden, develops agricultural practices in the student. The reason this is an intermediate rather than a short-term outcome is the complex nature of having all the skills necessary to grow plants. A short-term outcome actually might be developing a few of these skills, like planting seedlings or weeding and harvesting, but not the full set of skills needed to successfully grow your own food. Finally, there are the long-term outcomes. These evolve from both the short and intermediate outcomes, again, from a again, from the school garden logic model on the previous slide, one long-term outcome is the appreciation of fresh food. This pushes the sphere of influence beyond the school garden and cafeteria and all the way into daily life of the home and community. Ultimately, most of our farm to school programs are striving for these long-term outcomes. It is why we do the work we do. But in your evaluation, you want to be careful and realistic about what your program has been able to achieve to date, as well as what is realistic to measure. It is important to distinguish between your short, intermediate, and long-term impacts. If you measure long-term impacts before it is possible for these to have occurred, your evaluation will miss finding the ways it has had an impact. So this is a good time to pause and do a quick poll, and then we'll turn our attention to indicators and measures. Um, okay, we are going to take a look at the difference in short, intermediate, and long-term impacts from your perspective. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, again, the poll will be on the right side of your screen, and I have thinking music for you. Okay, five more seconds. Looks like some of you are still answering. Okay, great. It looks like the majority of you are doing short term and intermediate term, and we also have some long term outcomes, so that's great.
This is perfect. Um, like last week, we had a wide range of answers on all of our polls, and and this is what makes actually this um, webinar training exciting is the very different kinds of um, evaluations that are occurring as well as, of course, where your farm to school program is. If you're measuring long-term impacts, you've got a farm to school program that has been going on for a little bit of time here. And it's exciting to see that that's um, a possibility and you're going to really look at those long-term impacts. Okay. So um, actually, before we go any further in the training, I just want to pause for a moment and give people an opportunity to ask questions instead of waiting all the way to the end of the um, webinar. If you have any questions about logic models or short, intermediate, long-term outcomes or anything else we've covered so far, please type your questions into the chat box, select all panelists before submitting, and then I'll read those questions before I answer them. Um, we'll just do this as a very short break, but if you do have a question, we might as well just answer it now before we get into the next section. Okay, so far I see nobody asking any questions. I'll just wait maybe, oh, there we are. At what point in the program does it make sense to even begin to measure long-term outcomes? This seems like a minefield for overreaching, although we all have those in mind. Um, so that's an excellent question. And really what it comes down to is thinking about um, when you put together your evaluation plan and you start to really look at in a systematic way connecting your activities to those outcomes, you, you'll begin to be able to um, see whether or not there are opportunities for it to reach beyond those intermediate ones. And so I have to say, even though I've been presenting this as though those are clear, clear cut areas, there's some flexibility, there's some kind of gray areas between short and intermediate and intermediate and long. And so you will get to a point where you've got some intermediate income outcomes that are actually bumping over into those kind of system changes. And a great example would be this. You might have an intermediate outcome in procurement where you have your food system um, um, service director who is um, start tracking local produce and they've created a tracking um, process, so they've got a practice in within their accounting system. It may be that now that in two years, two or three, that they're not just tracking, but they've developed a policy that the first thing they're going to do is to bid out for local before they go and start doing um, any other kind of procurement. That would pop over into a kind of very senior level intermediate and even a long-term outcome. So you really have to think about where it fits and you should know you can do long-term outcomes, but you don't want to jump right to the end before you've got some of those other ones in place first. Any suggestions for measuring long-term outcomes for a nonprofit doing on-farm education with many different schools? We usually don't see the same students more than once. So I have to tell you, I would have to know more about what you're doing, but off the top of my head, I would think you're really not looking at long-term outcomes, um, at least not with the students who are coming in. Um, with the students, you're having an opportunity to um, evaluate what kinds of things they're learning while they're visiting, unless you have an opportunity to follow up with them later and um, and that there's additional supports that come out of their farm visit or the on-farm education that you're doing, you would have a hard time making that connection. So I think you really have to stick to the, um, the more short and intermediate term outcomes. Okay, so those were very nice questions. You should know we will have Q&A at the end of the webinar also. So if you didn't get a chance to submit, please 
go ahead, type those somewhere, jot them down, don't forget them. You'll have an opportunity to tell us again. Oh, one moment. Oh, I do have one more. In developing a theory of change, you must state your underlying knowledge and assumptions, but I don't see that in logic model models. Is there a place for that? So that's a, that actually is a really wonderful question because a theory of change and logic models, while they have some similarity to them, they are really quite different ways of conceptualizing. A theory of change is also a wonderful way to um, set up an, your evaluation plan to identify the types of things that are happening, your um, conditions and preconditions that need to be there, so your very long-term goals, your intermediate ones, which we call your preconditions that have to be there, the types of activities that need to happen in order for those preconditions to be there. You can use all of that to also set up um, your evaluation plan. It's just a different way of doing it. Um, so you're right. You wouldn't see that in the logic model because that's not the language of the logic model. Both of them are wonderful conceptual frameworks, though, for getting you to think um, strategically and um, logically, <laughs> I guess, about your um, farm to school evaluation plan. Okay. Um, okay, I am going to move us on in just a minute. And here we go. Let's turn our attention to measures and indicators. Now we're really getting into evaluation speak. The terms indicators and measures are often used interchangeably. In part, this is because the two are very similar. In part, it's because there is some disagreement about their definitions. Some evaluator courses would teach you that measures are those things that measure something, and indicators are those things that indicate something, which sounds a little bit circular, but it's also kind of an easy way to think about it. It is a nice shorthand, and it sounds easy enough, but it turns out even that is less clear the more you dig into it. If that's not enough confusion, consider this. Sometimes what looks like one person's outcome or goal is another person's indicator. They're calling it an indicator. And measures could be couched in language that tells you what type of data needs to be collected, or it might be framed more in terms of an indicator or even an outcome. How in the world are you going to figure out this maze of confusion? How can you hope to navigate through all this confusion? Well, basically, you don't need to. Let go of the labels. It's not your role or purpose in life to become a professional evaluator. You just want to evaluate an aspect of your farm to school program. At a certain point, the weeds really are the weeds. Now, I want to pause for just a moment, though. I'm not trying to say that indicators and measures are not meaningful. You will see these words used in many places as you work on your evaluation. But because, you're not consist because they're not consistently used, and yet sound as though they should have a very specific meaning, I think the best way and the best approach is to stick to your script and not try to become a professional evaluator well-versed in the language of evaluation. That is, just remember the purpose of your evaluation. Is it for program improvement? Is it for sharing your information with stakeholders? Is it for your funders? Knowing who your audience is is going to help you choose the right data to collect, whether that's a measure or an indicator. Remember your sphere of control, the activities of your program and the audiences you're reaching. This will help you identify which types of evaluation outcomes you can realistically expect to address, the data collection instruments that will work best, and the questions you need to ask and the existing data you should collect. And then finally, remember your sphere of influence, those short, intermediate, and long-term outcomes you're hoping the Farm to School program will produce. Knowing what you hope to accomplish will help you select appropriate questions and data collection methods. Now let's discuss indicators and measures using examples from the National Farm to School Network's evaluation framework, which is called Evaluation for Transformation. This is a good opportunity to better understand both evaluation speak and to see how the framework and the evaluation toolkit can work together. But 
First, a little bit about this evaluation framework, which has just been released. The primary aim of the framework is to provide guidance on how to consistently track and monitor program activities across a wide array of farm to school um, um, sites, as well as to track changes in local, state, and national policies that influence farm to school. To fully understand and realize the potential of farm to school, they have developed a cross-sectoral approach. Indeed, farm to school has broad reaching impacts that touch public health, community economic development, education, and environmental quality. And in fact, we saw those in the um, various um, outcomes that you shared in the chat box. Every single one of those was addressed. So let's make some connections between what we have already learned and the farm to school evaluation framework. In the framework, priority outcomes, indicators, and measures are identified for each of the four sectors that I just mentioned. So let's take a look at public health. Within public health, one research outcome is increased consumption of local and healthy foods. Indicator number two in their framework specifically identifies a population, that of students, as the population you would evaluate about student preferences for local healthy foods. Measure 2.1, increase in student awareness and knowledge about food and nutrition's impact on health, is measuring a short-term outcome because it's assessing the student's level of learning. Measure 2.3, increase in the amount of local fruits and vegetables students report eating, is measuring actions as it is about behavior change. This would be an intermediate outcome on the logic model. This research outcome, its indicator and measures all fall within the sphere of influence because while this is the reason we do the work we do, we really don't have any direct control over it. The best we can do is design farm to school activities that will influence students learning about local food and its health impacts and change their behavior to eat more local food. Okay, we've covered a lot in a short amount of time. Specifically, we've discussed the difference between a sphere of control, those things we have some amount of control over, the sphere of influence, the reason we do all this farm to school work, and while we will need to provide evidence of those things within the sphere of control, like it is good to know how many students are participating in our activities and how many pounds of produce have come out of your school garden, if you want to demonstrate impact of your program, you need to measure those things that are within the sphere of influence. The concept of indicators, measures, and measures was introduced, and in reality, research and evaluation books go into great detail about indicators and measures, and there are differing definitions of both. Don't get hung up on the terminology of evaluation speak. Instead, stick to the basics. Know your activities, your target audience, and your outcomes. And finally, because many of you will also use the National Farm to School Evaluation Framework to guide your work, it is useful to know and think about how to link their indicators and measures to your activities and outcomes. Okay, let's get started on your work today. I bet you were wondering when we were. Get out that evaluation plan template. If you were on last week's webinar, you will continue filling out your plan that you already started. If you're joining us for the first time, no worries. You can still work on step two. After today's webinar, you can go to our archives and listen to webinar number one, Overview and Getting Started on Your Farm to School Evaluation, which will walk you through step one of the template. There are seven attachments for this toolkit. Each attachment is focused on a specific group. One is students, then parents, teachers, food service staff and operations, producers, school leadership, and community members. Before we go further, let's stop for a quick poll. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so for those of you who have just joined us, the polling panel will appear on the right side of your screen and you'll have about 30 seconds to answer. Um, so the poll is basically we're asking who your main target audience is and although in um, a real evaluation you will probably have many target audiences for the purposes of this exercise, we would just like you to select one. I don't see. Okay, okay, we're waiting for uh, the final polling questions to uh, finish.
Okay. Ah, so many of you are actually going to be focusing on students. Food service staff and operations is the second most common one, followed by teachers. And then we're also um, folks who are talking about focusing on producers and school leadership and community members. The only group that I don't see anyone looking at um, as the main target audience are parents. But this is really amazing. All of these different groups are part of the target audiences. And so here we go again. This is a great diverse group. And this is exciting because we're going to really be able to use this toolkit fully and learn a lot from each other. Okay, this is the front page of attachment one, which is outcome for students. Many of you did indicate in the poll that students are your target evaluation group, and so in that case, you're actually going to be working with attachment one today. For others not focused on students, please choose that appropriate attachment that addresses your population that you just mentioned that you want to study in your farm to school evaluation. If you have not yet downloaded and opened the attachment for your target audience, please do so now. And while you're getting ready um, and getting that attachment out, Sophie, can you just share the Farm to School Activities poll result from our pre-webinar series survey? Sure. So um, there on the screen are the results of a pre-webinar survey that many of you answered after signing up for the series. There were 56 responses, and as you can see, we have a diverse group of participants. Over 30% of you are leaders of a Farm to School support organization, and many of you, over 20%, are researchers or evaluators, and almost 20% of you are members or participants of a farm to school support organization. There are also a large percentage of community partners, garden leaders, public health practitioners, and school food service staff, as well as university partners, farm to school coordinators, teachers, producers, food corps members, and school administrators in the audience. So it looks like uh, we don't have any students registered for this series, but we're hoping to change that, so please spread the word. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, as you learn about your fellow audience members, you may also be thinking about um, back to the section in last week's webinar about building your evaluation team. It may give you ideas for possible people to partner with as you move forward with your evaluation plan. Okay, it's quite a diverse audience. Here we go. Now you're going to be identifying outcomes for your farm to school evaluation. I've given you a lot of examples and I'm going to give you one more, um, but you really are using these attachments at this point to think about your own. I want you though, as you're thinking about this, to remember there are short-term outcomes at the individual level, including awareness, knowledge, attitudes, opinions, skills, and behavior. There's the intermediate outcomes that are actions, there are the changes in behavior, commitments, and practices, and there's the long-term outcomes about system change. These can be laws, policies, rules, regulations, the social, cultural, economic, and environmental impacts. For your evaluation, you'll only want to select a few outcomes to measure. While many outcomes are likely to be achievable through your program components that are part of your farm to school model, you don't want to measure all the outcomes. Instead, you want to select those that are most important for achieving the evaluation purpose you identified. And make sure you select outcomes that are realistically achievable from your program. You want to evaluate yourself against those changes you're most likely to be able to cause. Let's take a look at student outcomes that are identified in attachment one. So for example, um, for students you might be interested in knowing students' changes in their eating habits, their attitudes toward new foods, or their knowledge about healthy foods and food systems. You may want to know how many students are participating in a garden program, and also going on farm field trips or choosing enrichment programs that support healthy eating. From our logic model and SPHERES concepts, we see these outcomes touch on short and intermediate outcomes within the sphere of influence, and that the counts are really the outputs that are within that sphere of control. All of these are important and good things to measure. Let's take a look at the types of outcomes in the toolkit for each of the target groups. This table actually is from page four of the toolkit guide document. 
We already discussed the students, so let's move on. The attachment for parents and for teachers includes different types of outcomes that tap into four specific areas. These are improved attitudes, increased knowledge, change in eating habits, and involvement in farm to school programs. For food service staff and operations, the types of outcomes that you could measure on include improved staff attitudes and commitment, increased staff knowledge, increased use of local foods, the increase of salad bars, the affordability of the farm to school program, waste management changes and facility changes. The attachment for producers covers outcomes related to their increased awareness of farm to school opportunities, food safety knowledge, food safety practices, increased local sales and involvement in farm to school programs. And finally, All right, one moment. Um, and finally, outcomes, oh, I'm sorry, and finally, school leadership taps into both individual and system outcomes, improved attitudes and or knowledge, and changes in policy and funding, and then finally, community outcomes, which can be important to the sustainability of a farm to school program, and we saw that a couple of you were in planning to do community outcomes. These include individual level outcomes, improved attitudes and or knowledge of system level outcomes, which includes increased food programs and activities in the community. Okay, there's a lot of outcomes that are available to take a look at and to measure. So everyone look at your handout. If you've chosen attachment one, outcomes for students, your first page is going to look like this screenshot. As you page through your attachment, you will see in the far right, one of the far right hand columns, many different outcomes. In attachment one, there are actually 14 different outcomes. These are the changes in the student's attitude, knowledge, behavior, and health that can result from your farm to school programs. You'll be selecting the outcome or outcomes most relevant to the components of your program. Let's take just a little bit closer look at the attachment so you know how to use it. First, on the far right column, you'll see information about the type of outcome. In this example, we're looking at outcomes related to student knowledge. In the first row, the next column, are the outcomes that we see um, in student outcome number one, student gains in knowledge and awareness about gardening and school gardens. In the next column, we provide a short description of the type of programming activities that are likely to align with the outcome. For outcome number one here, we point out that if your program includes garden education or a school garden, then this outcome may be appropriate. Arguably, this is a little redundant, um, but in and this is a particular to this, this one. You'll see as you flip through the attachment that a lot of these, in fact, are um, not just examples of exactly the outcome. So they will help you figure out, if I do this in my program, is this an outcome I really can measure? And then in this column, you'll see that we describe the types of measurement tools we have found that address this outcome. In this case, we have found two measurement tools, a survey and a focus group question protocol. And in the last column, we point you to specific data collection tools that, you, that have been used to measure this outcome. We provide the name of the tool a hyperlink to download it, and other helpful information like the page numbers if it's part of a large report, as is the focus group questions, or notations about its use. For example, the survey tool that we've identified is appropriate for both younger and older children. Now's a good time to give one last real farm to school evaluation example. Here we see the student outcome number one that we just looked at, student gains in knowledge and awareness about gardening and school gardens. A classroom garden project in San Antonio's independent school district was implemented with elementary age children to bring experiential learning about horticulture, gardening, and developing relationships with peers. To evaluate the benefits of the participation, data was collected on 52 second and third grade students. Actually, some of this data included the kids drawing pictures about their garden experience. In addition to the pictures, qualitative interviews were conducted with the children, parents, teachers, and the master gardener and the school principal. A brief structured interview was developed for the study, and this was very brief, and I'm particularly pointing this out because this is a simple and yet very effective evaluation that was conducted. Generally, the same questions were covered with all the participants in approximately the same order. 
Questions were open-ended and consisted of the following inquiries. For the adults, they asked, what are the effects of gardening on the children? And what are the changes you've noticed in the children? And to the children and adults, they asked the simple questions of, what are the good things about the gardens? And what are the bad things about the gardens? The data was coded into themes, and six themes emerged that demonstrated the garden had many positive effects on school children. The children demonstrated increases in moral development, enhanced their daily academic learning, gained pleasure from watching the products of their labor flourish, and had the chance to increase interactions with parents and other adults. In addition, the children learned the value of living things, plus the anger and frustration that occurs when things of value are harmed out of neglect or violence. This is a great example of unexpected learning that comes from doing even a simple evaluation. Likely, the evaluators did not have the expectation that moral development would be one of the learning outcomes from this school garden program. As you review the attachments, I want you to select one or more outcomes that are realistic for your program and useful for you to measure. First, review all the types of programs listed in the column. That is in, this may be a fit for your program if. And now is the time to remember the purpose of your evaluation. For example, if you're primarily doing an evaluation to meet a funding requirement, you really want to focus only on those outcomes that are most in alignment with your funder's priorities or the requirements of your grant. Or if you're primarily doing the evaluation to improve your program, you want to select the outcomes that you believe are the most important results that will help you figure out, is your program working the way you wanted it to work? And how can you know if it is? So if you have already not, not already started, what I want you to do is take a look at these outcomes and start to put stars next to them or highlight, circle, whatever it is to make sure that you're identifying those things that look like they're the outcomes you really want to focus on in your evaluation. So I'm assuming everybody's kind of scribbling, you're reading, you're looking. You know, just like last week, you're not going to be able to complete this component of your evaluation plan just in this webinar, but you're going to get started on it. And so I know you're working on it now. Um, as you're working on it, I'm going to just remind you that you're also going to be thinking about those short and intermediate and long-term outcomes. Um, these are really going to come into big play next week when we start talking about what kinds of questions and tools you'll use to measure the outcomes that you're identifying this time. So. As we do this, um, you can see here is a quick little piece of your evaluation template. Over on the far left-hand side is your outcome. So you're really going to only list one outcome per row on your evaluation template. But in that next column of program activities, you might actually have several program activities that are related to that one outcome. So you could bullet out those program activities that are related to that particular outcome. And again, next week, we're going to focus on selecting measurement tools and adapting the tools. And so we'll continue filling out the evaluation plan template. Today, you're really just working on your outcome and program activities related to that outcome. So as far as the training goes, um, this wraps up today's webinar. We hope you have a better understanding of farm to school outcomes, indicators, and measures, and we hope that you've made some progress on your evaluation plan and know how to keep making progress on step two. And of course, we hope that you are continuing to grow your confidence in undertaking an evaluation. We also hope that you're going to join us next week for choosing and adapting tools. If you have not yet signed up for the other webinars in the series, please do so at the link on this slide. And at the end of today's webinar, you'll be directed to a survey to help us improve our trainings. Again, think of it as your opportunity to participate in an evaluation of a farm to school activity. And we appreciate being able to learn from you. And actually, those of you who filled it out last week, which was most of you, it actually was very helpful in our designing of this survey, um, or I'm sorry, in our designing of our um, training today. 
And everyone who signed up for webinar number one has already received an invitation to join our Google group, which currently has 32 members. And this is a place where you can post questions, share ideas, and let folks know how your evaluation is going. And of course, I'm hoping, because it is a Google group, you're going to answer people's questions or, you know, give them encouragement let folks know that the same things are happening or let them know that, oh, man, we figured this out for ours this way or whatever it is. It really is this peer-to-peer -peer learning that we're hoping to do. And, of course, as the evaluators that are doing the training on this, we are happy to also chime in. Um, if this is your first webinar with us and you would like to join the Google group or for some reason you did not receive the invitation because maybe it went into your spam, please type into your browser the link on this slide where you can request to join. And then finally, I want to let you know um, that through our USDA Farm to School grant, Spark Policy Institute is able to offer up to four hours of free technical assistance to up to 20 sites or organizations who participate in the training and are using the Farm to School Evaluation Toolkit. I'll actually provide you with more information in our last webinar on this opportunity, but wanted to just give you a heads up. Okay. Now it's time to open up for our final Q&A, so please type in your questions in the chat and submit it to all panelists. I'm just going to give people a little bit more time because I know it takes time to type in a question. And um, just so you all know, only Sophie and I can see, so it doesn't have to be perfect spelling if you're like me and you type quickly. Um, not everything comes out uh, perfectly in the spelling. So as long as I can read it, we're all good with it. So if you're leaving, please do um, answer the survey that follows, and I hope we see you next week. I'm going to continue to leave this open um, just because we do have four more minutes on the webinar. And if anybody wants to type in a question, that's great. You also should know that you're more than happy to type in, of course, those questions or ideas on the Google chat. Or you could um, contact either me or Sophie directly, and we're happy to answer questions that way. Again, we are happy to answer questions if you have any. Oh, I see that one has just come in. Are there particular references used in the toolkit attachments to evidence the measurement types suggested? So each of the toolkits and their attachments are, um, so I should just, maybe I should back up a little bit by saying each of the attachments are existing, obviously. They're existing instruments, and these instruments, some of them are actually instruments that have come out of um, research that's out there. And some of these are instruments that have been used um, by other school districts already and have been successfully collecting data. And
so I'm, I'm, I actually am kind of not sure. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking me. So it would be great if you could expand upon your question because I don't think I probably answered it right. Um, here's a question. Will next week's webinar include definitions or ideas of what to put in number one through five in the data collections and analysis steps box? Yes, it will. That was an easy one to answer. Oh, no. Oh, oh somebody said they lost audio, but... Um, we'll follow up. Thanks for your explanation. Great. That actually, thank you. Um, and we are, um, we are happy to follow up in any way that is, um, easiest for you. And if there's any more questions, we still have one more minute. Okay, um, well, we are almost out of time, and so I'm going to give it to Sophie to wrap it up. Okay, thank you everybody for joining us, and again, um, please fill out survey number two, um, which you will access after you exit out of um, this, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you.